Welcome back, everybody. We're at Bradford Marine, obviously in the paint booth. Bradford has a facility off-site that gives them the ability to do parts painting and top coating uh, in a completely controlled environment. Uh, it's a really elegant facility. It's amazing the evolution that we've experienced in top coating and what it takes to put the shine on boats these days. Fortunately, I'm joined by Nasser Ahmed from Bradford and Larry Kappel from DITEC Marine, or is it DTEC? DTEC Marine DTEC Products. Marine products. Yes. So the reason that I've invited Larry and Nasser to join us is because these two guys know more about top coats, where they came from, where they went, and where they are today than any two guys I've been in the room with before. Thanks for joining us today, guys. Thanks for having us. I really appreciate you being here. So Larry and Nasser, what we wanted to talk about today uh, and help the yacht sales community understand is, let's go back a little bit. Let's move back in time and talk about where we started with top coating products. You know, you go into a marina, you, you walk down the dock, you, first thing you notice is the naval architecture and the design of the boat. But as you get closer, the top surfaces are really what's going to strike your attention. Sure. It's going to tell you how that boat's been maintained, how that boat was even built, because the more shine on it, the more you can see the imperfections. Monsieur, where did we start with top coating when you started in the early 90s? Uh, we started with enamels. Okay. We started applying them by brush method mainly, preparing the boats and getting them ready with enamel. We had to use different tricks, of course, to try to get it to flow by adding you know, some additives. So I remember Penetrol being we something we would put in, mm -hmm. and as you brushed along, the Penetrol would evaporate out. You'd have to add more, put in another cap full. Until it, you know, you get to the desired finish. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. So we started with brushing. Yes. And we started with products that weren't the plastic coatings that we actually use today, because that's really what these top coats are, yes. is plasticizing the products. Mm -hmm. So we started with brushing, and then where do we go from there? Larry, what, what, do, what do the guys tell you from the history books <laughs> <laughs> that they used to do after that? Well, going back, I, I was 14 years old when I started uh, working with boats as a, as a job, a summer uh -huh. job. And going in and seeing the, the artistry of paint back then, right. you're talking about rolling and tipping, right. it's amazing the finished result that was achieved with the technology that was being deployed to get the finished result. Amazing. But paint used to be very strong. And as we'll discuss, we've seen an evolution of regulatory changes that have restricted the solvents that can be introduced to uh, the paint system, the paint structure, or formulary, if you will. And that has definitely affected the strength of the urethane top coats that we use today. So we'll get to that because that's something that the community is familiar with, VOCs, right? right? If you go to Home Depot and you want to buy some paint to paint the wall in your living room, you're going to see that it's VOC compliant. Yes. But let's, let's roll back a little bit before we get to the new regulations and the new types of uh, uh, chemistries of the paints. And let's talk about, you mentioned rolling and tipping. So when we rolled and tipped, for the audience that doesn't know that, basically what they would do is they would put the roller in the paint, they would roll the paint out, but that would give you an orange peel finish. Yes. So the way that you would correct that orange peel is by tipping with the brush. So you take a badger hair brush and you and you'd tip it out yeah. and that would allow it to flow. And use a product like Penetrol to allow the paint to flow and lie flat. That was the, uh, the benefit of Penetrol at the time. As you mentioned, it would, it would evaporate out and then the cure would continue with the top coat. But the, so the it, Penetrol itself didn't change the chemistry of the no, paint. No, So no. it didn't destroy the finish no, no. or its ability to hold up over the long it was haul. A, it was a thinning uh, paint flow agent. Okay. Still is to this day. They still manufacture Penetrol. Right. And it would evaporate out and leave you the paint product. Correct. Right. So we started with brushing. We went to roll and tip as a better applied method. We gave us, uh, gave us a little bit more paint on the surface mm -hmm. and the ability to get it to flow out. And then in the early 90s, when you really started heavily into this, what was our application method? Uh, then we went to spraying after brushing. We start experimenting with the spraying that was introduced and we start getting into that and that brought a different set of uh, issues. 
So we were talking a little earlier about back in the day when they first started spraying, you'd drive into the marina downwind of wherever they were spraying something and it looked like it was foggy in there, right? Yeah. Definitely. So there was overspray everywhere. Yes. We didn't have the regulation or the, we didn't even have the awareness of how important it was to contain our environment. Sure. That's very accurate. accurate. Yeah. Then gradually we went into the protection, uh, the protection part of it, containment and everything else after a while. So it just changed and the products have changed also. So we learned to contain. We learned also by controlling our environment, we, uh, we resulted with a better finished product. We had less dirt in it. We had less lint in it. The, we control, like in this paint booth right here, we have humidity control, temperature control, and we have airflow control. So we're able to provide basically a perfect finished Finish. product. You're right. able to moderate all the variables in a, in a facility like this. So what you're referring to, you get far fewer uh, inclusions, whether that's dust or lint or whatnot, that all need to be addressed. Right. So having a safe or clean room, if you will, it makes a huge difference. It does, and if you, if you go into a paint booth that you could put a 50 meter boat in, mm -hmm. you're gonna find lighting like this, yes. you're gonna find downdraft ventilation, mm -hmm. so it keeps anything in the atmosphere down yeah. low, mm -hmm. and it doesn't settle on your paint. Correct. So again, we're gonna back up real quick. We talked about the different applications of brush, roll, and tip, and then spray, mm -hmm. but we had different products that we had to deal with back in the day as well. First, we had our Pettit type products. Um, where do we go from there? We went to uh, international, all, then we went to the all grip products, Sterling and what have you, Emron, and a host of other, I think DuPont too. We made, made, went to a bunch of different products. Yeah. So these were products that we brought out from other industries. Sure. We brought them from automotive, from aviation, and commercial, commercial cargo and cruise line, sure. which is one of the still, one of the few markets that still uses. Uh, single stage alkyd enamel. And that's basically because it's a, from a cost standpoint, number one, and a utility standpoint, number two, that vessels like that don't have the same focus on aesthetic detail. The fact that every square inch isn't perfect isn't necessarily important to a cargo or cruise line. So you just mentioned alkyd enamel. Yes. Okay, so that brings up a conversation about the chemistries of the different paints. Sure. And that's really the foundational difference between these different brands. 100%. Is their chemistries. So when we talked about the early days of Imron versus Allgrip, because those were the two primary choices that we would use in the mm -hmm. 80s or the early 90s, mm -hmm. what were the differences between those two? I know the, the most glaring difference was that you could blend one and you couldn't blend the other. Sure. But there's a reason why. Okay. So the two main differences are what we refer to as all grip, and some say G8001, or people say blue label, but original all grip is a poly, a linear polyester urethane. Okay. And what linear means is that as the product cures, the, the pigments settle on the bottom, and a layer of clear resin, polyester resin, cures on the top. So you've got your color on the bottom, and you've got your gloss on the top. Okay. So that is the definition of a linear urethane. Okay. The non-linear urethane, that's your DuPont, or we call Imron, right. now it's Zalta, but still the industry refers to it as Imron. Alex Seal is a hybrid of that. Okay. And then Axonobel, or at the time it was U.S. Paint, they introduced Allcraft 2000. And Allcraft 2000 was that company's answer to making a repairable product, which instead of using polyester as the base, the plastic base, moved to acrylic as the base. The acrylic's much softer and is blendable. Okay. So the downside that was discussed at the time was durability, right? in that an Allcraft 2000 finish wouldn't last as long as an Allgrip finish because of its uh, a softer product, not as hard as the, as the G line. Right. But new products and the evolution of, of chemistry, even in the advent of environmental restrictions, has introduced a lot of products that that have a lot more flexibility in user application and maintenance than the products did 20, 25, 30 years ago. Okay, so we've got a, a true chemical difference between the products. We had total. We had um, uh, alkalids, mm -hmm. and we had um, polyurethanes mm -hmm. or linear urethanes. Mm -hmm. So you said to me a little while ago that we had uh, we had much harder paints. 
and in that period of time. Sure. Let's talk about a little bit about what made those paints hard and what has changed in that arena. Certainly. Every aspect of the chemical industry, whether you're making paint or household cleaning agents or commercial cleaning agents, has been heavily impacted by environmental regulation. Okay. And what's most important to the paint industry is what's called VOC. And that's, that stands for volatile organic compounds, right. better known as solvents. Right. Okay? Okay. We used to be able to use solvents that would dissolve just about anything. So yeah. you could take very strong and hard, rich, raw materials and dissolve them in very strong solvents and create a product that was very durable. Yeah, you and could apply sure. it, then the solvent would evaporate off, and you'd be left with the base material. Absolutely. Okay. That now, because of VOC restrictions, which are every year it seems like there's a little bit more restriction and more restriction, for very good reason, protecting the environment right. um, and protecting the user because of uh, safety hazards with the, the solvents themselves and inhalation. But the industry has been really up against a wall trying to come up with new formularies that make a strong top coat within the guidelines of environmental restrictions. And that's been a challenge now for the better part of 15 years. I would say, I would say yeah, 15 years. So, you know, it's actually evident throughout everything that we use in, in whether we're talking about top coats, we're talking about uh, in automobiles, in combustion, in propulsion for boats, sure. uh, for power generation. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we've had another conversation the other day about fuel cells, and that's a whole new technology Absolutely. that is speaking to the environmental concerns. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that our industry, while viewed by many as one that is very difficult, tough on the environment, mm -hmm. very difficult, we actually are pioneers in exploring ways of preserving the environment and going where we would like to go and leaving no trace. And that goes everywhere from our propulsion and our exhaust right to our coatings and the way we preserve and maintain the products. Okay. So you say that VOCs has been a big difference, the regulatory environment on VOCs. When did that change? When has that really become a big thing for us? Well, this is, it, in my memory, I, I would say you go back a solid 15 years before really big changes were made in terms of environmental restrictions relative to VOC compliance. And the industry wasn't prepared at the time. And I actually think that the, the bigger impact was on GRP, which is glass reinforced plastic, which is what we call gel coat. Right. And gel coat was put for, they had the same restrictions that the paint manufacturers did. But they had an even more difficult time because all of a sudden they couldn't, they couldn't use the product that they knew. Right. And we've all seen from, I would say, yeah, 15 years to about nine, eight, seven, nine years ago, we were seeing a lot of difficulty with the finishes, the GRP finishes. That was all relative to environmental restrictions and VOC regulation, that they couldn't make the same product they were used to. And it's taken a long time to catch up and actually make products that have the durability and other attributes that, that the manufacturers, the applicators, and the owners are demanding. So a vast majority of our audience is dealing with boats that are fiberglass boats. They're not aluminum, they're not steel, they're not wood, they're fiberglass boats. Yes. And the top coating on the fiberglass that protects the fiberglass from the UV is that gel coat. Upside and downside of gel coat. Upside and downside? Well, I mean, your gel coat is essentially one of your mold release agents when you're making the hull, okay? Right. So you've got one aspect that puts a colorant that has, actually offers an aesthetic finish that's already built into the mold. Okay. I'll get the second is cost. Right. And it's far lower cost to leave a gel coat finish than it is to prep and fare and paint the same surface by a pretty considerable margin. As you're talking boats, even up to now, you still see boats in the 120 125, you know, 35 meter range right. that are still all gel coat. And one of the considerations for that manufacturing process is cost. One of the considerations that we, that we take in when you're advising a client as to what products to put on the boat for a top coat would be whether it's gel coat or uh, the material is made of aluminum or steel as the case may be or wood. So you're going to choose the products that we use as a top coat based upon the materials that the boat's made of. 
possibly in a fiberglass boat that has a gel coat base that you're going to prime and paint, you may choose one brand versus another because of the chemical composition of that product. So whether it's aluminum, whether it's steel, whether it's wood, whether it's gel coat fiberglass, as the case may be. Sure. So what you say, Larry, uh, about gel coat products, about VOCs, all of that brings to, to mind a conversation about what do we do after the fact. We, you say we had stronger paints. Regulation came in mm -hmm. that reduced the amount of VOCs we were allowed to use. It changed the solvents that we were allowed to use. Mm -hmm. So that brings forward a conversation I think that you mentioned you had in 2019. Sure. Sure, I, th I think that the conversation in 2019 was kind of, I would call it a seminal moment in the, the collective industry. Because for years, there have been you know, the idea of waxing a boat, or then it became acrylic sealants that were a polymerized plastic that was you know, wiped on and wiped off the surface that provided mm -hmm. some moderate protection. But resin technology, getting into inorganic resins that don't react with cleaning chemicals and don't react with the sun, and also don't contaminate or cause problems with the paint substrate have been evolving and become, becoming more of a presence in the industry. But there was some disagreement between paint manufacturers, paint applicators, and then product developers and applicators like myself that we weren't on the same page. And at 2019, Metz Trade in, in Amsterdam, there was a panel discussion that included a cross-section of the industry from paint manufacturers to applicators to designers to paint consultants. Everyone agreeing that in, in the modern era of, of top coat, providing some sort of after paint care is imperative to extending the life of a paint system. So and that was a first. The first time everyone in a, in a room was all in agreement. And then it comes down to what type of product and of course, just like any, any application, the applicator. Okay, so that's a perfect opportunity for us to look at some of the products that you brought with us today to show what we can do to preserve our paint or enhance our paint surfaces or gel coat surfaces as the case may be after the fact. Let's go out and take a look at your products. Fantastic. Okay. All right, so we've talked about surfaces. Let's talk about protectants, but Let's take a look in this booth over here. You know, one thing I'd like to step back and talk about mm -hmm. for just a moment, Larry, is you mentioned the chemistries. You talked about uh, linear polyurethanes and nonlinear polyurethanes. We talked about acrylics versus polyurethanes. Let's chat briefly about the chemistry. I don't want to go down into a chemistry class about this, sure. but these are significant differences in the makeup of the paints. Absolutely. I think that the main, we discussed linear and nonlinear. Right. And I, by just description, uh, a linear system is going to be a paint that as it cures, is going, pigments are going to settle on the bottom and clear resin forms on the top. And these are generally polyester urethanes, polyester being a very, very hard plastic coating. Okay? By nature, um, they're not repairable because of their structure. So the resin layer on the surface is not polishable due to its hardness. So, so you can't if you completely magnify that, that layer, what yes. you'd find is you'd find the color at the bottom, and then you'd find a clear coating clear on the top. Clear resin on the top. That's okay. correct. So to repair that, you'd have to remove the clear, fix the color, and then reapply the clear. Or respray an entire area with cut lines that are defined so that you don't have margin zones on the outside that need to be sanded. And we've all seen this in the industry. I, I think you can speak to this very, very clearly. That when you have what they know, known as sags in the paint, or you've got some inclusions, that uh, a painter will go back and wet sand and then polish that area. And around the perimeter of that repair leaves damaged clear resin, which exhibits itself as a halo over time because you've got pigments that are exposed. And on either side of the pigments, You've got a part of the, you've got resin on either side protecting it versus exposed pigments around the repair. So that's a that's linear, a halo. that's a linear, a linear system. Thing. Now nonlinear, that means that the paint itself, regardless if it's, it could be any of the nonlinear brands, they're all acrylics for the most part. Okay, the nonlinear paints are the same at the primer level as they are at the surface, and by nature of their chemistry being acrylic, 
Acrylics are much softer than polyesters. They're polishable and blendable. Because now you don't have to worry about the cut lines. Okay, exactly. So you can polish and blend and repair very effectively. But your color or your pigment is suspended throughout the, the entire layer of the mm -hmm. resin, yeah. as opposed to it separating in its curing process. Yeah. Now, the first hybrid was Alexil. Alexil was introduced as an answer to the non-repairability of polyester. All, all grip was the biggest resins. It was the, the most the, it was popular the, It was the most popular. It still is to this day. Right. It still uh, it still owns the largest share of the market. But what's been developed most recently, at least in the all grip brand, it's called all grip HDT, which is high definition technology. Now these are high solids, clear, repairable polyesters. The chemical industry, the Axonobles and the Alex seals have figured out how to soften the resin, integrate it with the more with the uh, with the pigments, okay, and create a surface that's repairable, but more durable due to surface strength than acrylic. So wasn't Allcraft 2000? Uh, is that a, a step in the process getting to the HDT? So All Allcraft 2000, yes, it was a, it was the acrylic it's answer. Sure of the two. Yes, it's it's uh, the regular polyurethane and the acrylic in one. It's repairable. It's as hard as the regular polyurethane, but repairable, it's repairable. That's so the, H, the HDT. 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 At HDT, the development on that product started, I believe, about eight years ago. Um, it's been, it's, it's becoming increasingly uh, used in the industry. Um, one of the major benefits is film thickness. Okay? When you use a linear urethane, just by, by its structure, you end up with a, a very nominal film thickness of the clear resin. Now, using a high solids clear, where you can do a two-stage application, you can apply the base coat and then clear over the top, which you can do with the Allcraft system, but you're doing it with acrylic instead of a hybrid that's, that's stronger than acrylic. Um, you have triple to quadruple the thickness of the resin film on the surface, which means you have a lot more repairability for your dock abrasions and minor damage that happens over the course of a year. And then the boat comes into Bradford for repair. Easy done, the guy's out, he's out, the boat's out, the owner's happy, the crew's happy, and the paint finish looks perfect. I think we understand a little bit better the difference in the actual chemical makeup of the paints. Let's go out now and talk about the protections that we mentioned earlier sure. and how we seal our paints and keep them, make them last longer. So having a facility like this to be able to put top coats on is incredible. Oh, it's fantastic. But let's preserve those surfaces sure. with some of the products that you brought with us today from DTEC. So Larry, tell us about, first of all, what challenges are we faced with with the top coat products and then what do we do to deal with that? Certainly. Well, let me give you a quick backstory on, on how this product line came to be. Okay. I started a detailing company in the Great Lakes 33 years ago. Okay. And at so a certain you had about two months out of the year that you could work, right? That we <laughs> enjoyed working. The rest of the time Wait, you shoveled snow. We did six, but we enjoyed two of them. Okay. So, yes, it was definitely a weather consideration that sure. uh, a lot of people aren't big fans of for more than eight weeks. Understandable. So we got into using a lot of different cleaning chemicals, cleaning a lot of boats, and we wanted to do something that was more environmentally responsible, and we tried everything out there. Uh, we went with every brand that said they were eco-friendly or environmentally responsible, eco-safe, you name it. And they didn't work. They were more expensive and they didn't work at all. Well, the big challenge is if you're going to be easy on the environment, your products have to be weaker. Right? Well, that's, that's not, not necessarily line? true. That was how eco-friendly, environmentally responsible, responsible products developed. Initially, they took the bad stuff out and basically left behind some surfactant which is uh, an ingredient in a product or a raw material that makes things foamy, okay, or right. bubble, okay, right. surfactant and water. Right. And that doesn't accomplish too many tasks beyond the general cleaning, removing a little bit of surface dirt. Right. So we were left with a, a bunch of products that made a claim but didn't do the job. So I set out to design products that met three fundamental criteria. One, environmental responsibility. Two, performance. And three, cost efficiency. Okay. And I've got to say, in performance, that also includes user safety. Right. The products, are, they perform, they're safe for the boat, and they're safe for the user. Okay. So those are the tenets of, of our product design. And I set out with, uh, with a very bright group of guys and, and developed a product line 
that's all built from the ground up that only includes raw materials that meet or exceed every known environmental standard. Okay. And that's a moving target, so that's something that we're working on continually and taking the advisement of our manufacturers and, and other people who've assisted with product development and making sure that we're staying compliant. Okay. So what our purpose is, is obviously we, we're, we have cleaning products that we want to be environmentally friendly, but one of the things that we were talking about in the booth there was preservative. Sure. And since the VOCs have been removed from the, from the paints, mm -hmm. those solvents don't allow us to apply those hard raw materials, so we have a softer product at the end of the day. The paint's not as strong as it used to be. That's correct. What do you do to protect that paint? Or gel coat being such a soft and porous product in its own right, just by virtue of its chemistry, how do we protect that stuff? Well, both gel coat and paint have the, the same inherent weaknesses. They just, they're slightly different. Okay. But to take a step back, you know, when you were talking about we get into protection, what we've developed is what we call 360 degrees of protection. Okay. We can clean and we can protect every single surface on, on a boat. It could be a car, but our main focus is, is in the yacht industry. And we know we've got every detail covered. Okay. So paint and Joko, what are the differences? They're both plastic, right? right? Paint is plastic, gel coat is plastic, anything's urethane, they're all in the plastic family. Gel coat is softer than most paints, okay? In addition to being softer, it's more porous, and, excuse me, not more porous, the pore structure of the surface is larger, meaning the diameter of the pores is greater. Okay. That and being a, a product that is actively degraded by UV exposure means that you've got a product that's, I don't want to call it fragile, but it's not as strong as it's a, as a durable. It's, a, it's not as durable as a, as a paint substrate finish on a yacht. That has a smaller that porosity. Smaller structure. porosity, exactly. Okay. So the idea behind creating preservation products, or we let's go back to the days when we were waxing, it was the same concept is we wanted to fill in those pores and level the surface to create a, a flatter, more even surface that dirt and other contaminants wouldn't stick to. And it would have and the, the other attributes in the, in the formula that would prevent against UV degradation, and which we know is, is oxidizing. Um, and in, in the case of gel coat, it's actually the UV, UV light is actually disintegrating the gel coat on the surface. Okay. So developing products that both enhance, protect, and don't contaminate, that has been the challenge. Okay. So what we're trying to do basically is we're trying to fill in that microscopic imperfection on the surface or the porosity as we called it and provide a surface that's perfectly, perfectly filled, mm -hmm. perfectly smooth, perfectly level as yes. the case may be and it doesn't and durable. Hold, and durable. So it doesn't hold dirt and it reflects the sun. Sure. And the, the challenge in the industry leading up until the last seven or eight years has been developing and deploying protection that will last a year. So I thought that was pretty simple. You just wipe it down with ceramic and move on with life, right? Well, the, the term ceramic is very generic in the, okay. in the resin coating industry, okay? Ceramic specifically refers to resin coatings that have silica dioxide, okay. which is SiO2, okay. okay? So SiO2 is corked, it's beach sand, right? But if you take clear, pure white uh, quartz and you grind it into a fine powder, and you dissolve it in a solvent like benzene, you can do a wipe on, wipe off application, or as we were discussing previously, we were talking about roll and tip methods. There are some ceramic applications that are roll and tip, okay? Uh, you're putting a, effectively a glass coating on top of the paint substrate. Okay, so what happens, Nasir, if someone puts that surface on there, and then uh, after a period of time, the sun, the dirt cleaning methods have degraded that surface and they bring it to you and they want to have it painted. Then we'd have to uh, start the preparation again. Nasir's not a very happy guy when he gets no, one of those boats. Yeah, you know, contamination is there. I think it's okay if you tell him, it's when he gets surprised that he yeah. doesn't like it. Yeah. And that's the challenge, record mm -hmm. keeping. You know, not, it's not like an airplane log yeah. where you have everything that's ever been done written mm -hmm. down and you can refer back to it. Mm -hmm. So more often than, than not, people are going to bring you a product that's degraded and ask you to to make it you know make it perfect or make you know re repaint it as the case may be or refinish and you'd have an issue 
Because one, you don't know what's on it. Two, mm -hmm. you don't know what the product that was used. You start with a, with a surface that might have been contaminated or have something that would react to your paint products. So you have to know what's on it to begin with. If not, it goes into a er trial and error process until you're able to figure it out. So are there products that we can apply that don't bring forward those inherent problems that Nasir is talking about with the ceramic coating and you not knowing that it's ceramic coated? Absolutely. Okay. And, but before I, I talk about the, those types of resins, um, one of the issues that, that Nasir faces and Bradford faces when clients don't divulge that they've had a ceramic treatment, and I, I, when I say ceramic, I want to go back and say silica dioxide, SiO2, mm -hmm. okay? That quartz, once it's sanded, okay, First of all, it gets into all the pores of the paint, as, as any ground. resin coating is supposed to. Right. It's supposed to fill in the pores of the paint. But we're putting now, we're putting a glass coat on top of a plastic finish. Okay. To similar materials to begin right. with, okay? And now you've got this quartz on the surface that when you do a repair or a full repaint, when you're sanding, you're releasing silica dust into the air. And now all the boats are tented in plastic. Okay? That plastic is statically charged. Okay. Now, all that silica dust goes to the, to the, the walls of the tenting. Okay? Okay. And all it takes while you're painting or you're doing your prep is that puff of air, and now you've got silica dust on the surface, and you get fish eyes. Okay. And then the painters, for, years, for a number of years, were going, scratching their head. What's going on? Is there we did water the in my right. hose? Is the filter bad? So Something. I was involved with a 77-meter with a repaint in 2017. Uh -huh. And... Um, it was, it was in Europe, and the boat didn't divulge that they'd had their hull ceramic coated. Oh, boy. And it was a windy winter in, in southern France. Oh, boy. And the entire paint shop was contaminated. Oh, no. So that, that one project led to a complete rethink about preparation, cleaning, decontamination, all the steps that are necessary if you know a boat has a ceramic coat. Okay. That, now, I'm going to give you a caveat here. I'm not saying that ceramic coats don't do their job. They're marketed to seal the pores of the paint, create a smoother surface that's resistant to soot, resistant to environmental contamination, and will help maintain the color of the, of the paint or the gel coat. But my thought process was, if I have a plastic finish, why don't I develop a plastic-based resin? So I developed a resin family that is plastic and not glass, okay? Okay, so now you have two substrates that are quite similar, okay? They react very well together. The binding capacity is far greater than trying to put glass onto plastic. Your repairability is greater. Uh, the wear is, is consistent with, with any other protection system in the resin families. But for a guy like Nasir and Bradford, when they do a repaint, they don't have to worry when one of my boats comes in with my product on it because it will pose no problems with repairing or repainting. So I'll give you a quick chemistry lesson. I'll keep it as simple as possible. I like those. I said SiO2. Right. Okay, that's one silica atom with two oxygen atoms attached to silica it. Silica okay? dioxide. So those are two attachment points. All right? SiO2, that's one molecule. Polysiloxane, okay, is silica and oxygen as well. But it makes a chain of silica and oxygen. Okay? And you make that chain short or long. The longer it is, the more complex it is. Okay. But to give you uh, uh, an illustration of polysiloxane, those are the caulk seams between teak boards. Okay. That's polysiloxane. Okay. So I thought that was thiacol. Thiacol is a version of polysiloxane. Okay. So, Not so and that good is, for that rocket is, ships, but damn good yeah, on teak decks. Absolutely. So the, the, the interesting aspect of that is that you've got a molecule of silica dioxide that makes beach sand. But if you take the, two, the same two atoms and you put them into a chain, okay, you get a rubbery product like econol caulk. Or you can engage, you know, engage the raw materials in creating a product like our DTEC Ultra or our DTEC ProTech 1 that are plastic-based uh, uh, protectants. Okay. Okay. And then when we say, I mentioned earlier, I said inorganic. The big benefit of ceramics and products like DTEC uh, ProTech 1 and DTEC Ultra is they are inorganic. And that means that day-to-day -day use, okay, is and wear and tear via uh, abrasion is the only thing that removes the product. Cleaning chemicals don't remove it. The sun doesn't damage it. 
it becomes a sacrificial layer that throughout the service life of that product, the defined service life, all right, is not uh, allowing the paint substrate or the gel coat substrate below to, be to deteriorate. Okay. And then as this product deteriorates, you reapply it on, refresh. A on a prescribed yeah. schedule yeah. so that you're never getting back down to that substrate, but you're maintaining your protective film or your protective coatings sure. on top. And that gives you protection for your paint or gel coat as the case may be, a much longer life for that substrate product. And basically what you're doing is applying a sacrificial layer. You got it. We sacrifice, replenish, yep. sacrifice, replenish. So it, it is a service cycle, okay? One right. of the things I'd, I'd mentioned previously, in the industry, the industry was striving to achieve a, a product or develop a product that would last for a year. And in my opinion, anything beyond a year really isn't a, um, isn't really viable. The, the, the environment that a, a boat lives in, day-to-day -day exposure, weekly cleaning, scrub downs, repairs, dock abrasions, uh, a boat lives a very, very different life from an automobile Despite or any, uh, any other piece of equipment. Right. And if you're up north or you're down here, the type of sun uh, and exposure you're in all year long versus going into a storage building in the winter, those are all going to impact service life. But the, the main, main driver for, for durability is going to be the inorganic nature of the resins. Okay. So we discussed earlier, I'll go through a, 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 couple of, a couple of things. We talked about roll and tip yeah. versus wipe on, wipe off. Mm -hmm. One of the benefits of, of all of these after paint treatments or resins is that they don't need to be done in a controlled environment because you're wiping on, for, in most instances, instances, you're wiping on product, creating a thin film, and you're wiping off the residue. So if there are dirt inclusions or dust or something that's in the air that, that you don't want on the surface, it doesn't it matter. Because you're wiping that off when you, when you uh, remove the residue from the product. Okay. So that also creates thin, I said thin film, we call it thin film chemistry. Um, it doesn't take a whole lot of product to provide protection. But one of the downsides to the SiO2 uh, field of products is that when they're used in a roll and tip method, you get a very thick film. Okay, and because it's, it's quartz and doesn't have the ability to flex and stretch, as every hull, every boat superstructure is going to expand and contract during the day with heating and cooling, and torsionally with, with movement, um, they fracture. You're gonna find cracking in they there. They crack. And you may not be able to see it, they but crack. it's there. Yeah, and there are, I wanna say there are no um, non-destructive ways to remove um, ceramic coating. Okay. That's only partially true because they, they, there have been hydrofluoric acid gels that have been developed to, to remove ceramic coatings because hydrofluoric acid is the, is the only known acid that attract, it attacks quartz. It dissolves quartz. No other acid will. Okay. So the problem is just that like... That sounds pretty significant. That sounds it's, pretty, it's pretty severe. severe. It's pretty severe. Yeah. It's pretty severe. And um, a couple things have, have been determined since the inception of of these types of removal gels to ameliorate or minimize the downside of those types of coatings. But it sounds like by its basic premise, it's contradictory to the whole idea of reduced VOCs and less harm to the environment, but we have to use something so super strong yes. to remove that coating. That, that's very true, but there's a secondary issue that I think is more important, and that's the damage to the substrate itself, the paint. So when you put hydrofluoric acid on a surface, it doesn't know where the coating stopped and, and the paint, paint began. Begins, sure. Just like a piece of sandpaper, when you're doing your prep, you don't know where the, the coating stopped and the, and, and the paint starts. So when I say my comment that I don't really believe that there's any non-destructive method to remove it, that's my point. Because what we've discovered with the use of hydrofluoric uh, removal gels is that they make the paint substrate hydroscopic meaning that something that used to shed water and be water repellent now absorbs moisture, right. which brings, brings with it a number of other concerns and problems that basically lead, the, uh, lead to the, the need to repaint. Okay, all right. So what we've learned today is that paintings come a long way. Yeah. Surface preparations have come a long way. Surface protections have come a long way. Mm -hmm. We've. Uh, We've gone everywhere from the prehistoric days of our enamels and brushing through roll and tip 
mm -hmm. through applications through spray, uh, the different chemical compositions of the different products that we use to protect the surfaces and enhance the beauty of the boats. Mm -hmm. Ms. Sierra and Larry, thank you so much for your expertise, for volunteering your time to do this and educate the community about the beauty and cosmetics and surface preparations and protections on the boats. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And that's a wrap for today. Yacht Engineering Week 2023 has been brought to you by our title sponsor, Pantropic Power, the local cat dealer. And our anchor sponsor, Robert Allen Law, the business of yachts. We would also like to thank our segment sponsors, Lurson, Viking Marine Exhaust, Zemos, Marine Data Solutions, MPI, Bradford Marine, Ditec, Lewis Marine Supply, MPT, Tropic Ocean Airways, Wards Marine Electric, Seba, Aquabanas. We'll see you again tomorrow, 9.30 sharp.